All right, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about um, an interdisciplinary focus looking at ranges of architecture, urban planning, urban ag, aquaponics, at art and education around the concept of regenerative placemaking. Um, I think this is appropriate at the GSD at this particular moment with the focus on architecture and food um, and, and this concept of resilience, very questionable concept of resilience. Um, so my background, just really briefly, I went to school for architecture at Cornell. I graduated um, bachelor's of architecture and master's, master's of science in urban, architecture and urban design. And um, my doctorate was in urban planning at Columbia University. So to frame this a little bit, on the one hand, I'm looking at architecture from the science of the art and science of the building, right? Uh, it is it becomes a product, and the, it is a product of work that is supposed to reflect a level of consciousness in our society. It's supposed to. Um, urban planning is the interrelationship of those as played out with a sociological or social science approach. It's supposed to be. Um, both of which have created a paradigm and a particular way of thinking and doing and approaching um, design styles and implementation practices and policies for how we look at cities. So the city, the city is, a, is an interesting living organism. Unfortunately, it's not always treated as a living organism. It's treated as a kind of an after the fact, after the fact political um, experiment. Uh, so my city is the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago is an amazing city, absolutely amazing city. Um, it is a place that I call home, that I have my roots, and it is a gorgeous city in areas. It has a very particular image, a postcard image that is celebrated um, time and time again. That is a legacy of archety archetypes, architectonics, architectologies, what have you, um, you know, that express a certain type of statement about the city and about capital and wealth and accumulation. And um, there are these remnants and legacies. You know, we've, we've talked about Mies. We've talked about a lot of different architects that have experimented and done some profound work in the city of Chicago. So the question is the city of by design. Uh, and you cannot talk about the city of Chicago without talking about Daniel Burnham, who was an architect, who became a planner, and had this profound concept of looking at the system and the, arter the arteries and the infrastructure and the roadways that would in inform a century of planning for architects. Um, so, you know, there was some really elaborate um, drawings and illustrations. Not much of it was actually built, but it, it set the pathway in a way of thinking about the city that did successfully attract people. So over the course of the city, uh, over the century, from 1900, you can see the, the population growth. Um, there's phased developments of the city based off of the plan of the city. Uh, and then we have proudly 77 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. Um, however, when you look deeper, there is an interplay of meaning and value that plays out over space, throughout space. And this interplay, I'm going to give a quick snap a slap shot of, of the century. And if you pay close attention, just really quickly, the, the over, the blue is the over 90% white demographic, and the red is the over 90% black. For some reason, we always end up in the red. So um, as you watch the great migration and the flooding of populations that come into the city, look at the congregations of where the populations are landing or forced, and the housing. And it creates a very telling narrative of the century of issues and problems in the city of Chicago. Now, that's just looking at where people live. What's interesting in the academic world is always this taxonomy of research and analysis and analytics of, uh, of ways to study. So there's been years and years and decades of studies of this problem with very little approach towards solutions that resolve this issue. So we have witnessed and we have uh, documentation 
overly documented, these landscapes of un uneven development. But when you start looking, diving even deeper, you start looking at where is the density of these vacant buildings? Where is the overlap of the foreclosure? Where is the distant, the, where is the, the patterns of disinvestment, the concentrations of poverty and unemployment? They are all in the heavily concentrated in the same areas, particularly in African-American communities. The quality of schools are impacted. The health is impacted. There are all these overlays of problems that are heavily concentrated in the same target areas, food access or lack of access. Change in neighborhood income for decades. And unfortunately, the city that I love and cherish is divided by its killings and homicides. The abundance of guns and drugs and crime that is starting to tip all throughout the city of Chicago. Um, so we have these chronic urban problems of physical deterioration of housing, poverty, unemployment, health issues, and environment. And so for some reason, our academic studies tend to create silos to study them individually. And then organizations are created individually to, to respond to them instead of looking at the holistic approach towards these problems. So now we have a tale of two cities. This is not an unfamiliar situation. Dallas has it. Detroit has it. Every major city has it. Um, our city is plagued by a segregation that is a legacy tantamount to South Africa. And there are lots of studies that are starting to look at this. And now there's, to a point, there's a call for a new plan for Chicago to appreciate the Burnham plan, but look at the actual social realities that the city has. So and now, just going back, a step back, this is a school, the GSD, this concept of abstraction and representation of the city there are gazillions of million and billion dollar proposals for downtown and north side of Chicago, where in certain areas of the economic collapse, they never filled the housing to begin with. So there's also a materiality, a use of glass, a certain type of look and feel. That was a 41 story unit building, like downtown. There is an aesthetic form, form that is recreated and repeated. And there is this fascination of utopia about water and biking and uh, you know, play in concentrated areas. Um, this is an interesting situation. Uh, it's 40 acres of building, two and a half million square feet of building. Uh, the old post office that became antiquated and lost its programmatic function because post office has changed. And it got neglected. And then it was purchased for $40 million. And then it was a $130 million redevelopment proposal that kind of treated the building, but then had this new development in front of it, not really addressing the issues, not really addressing the problems. And it's excessive, lavish waste of wealth. The reality is that we have this history of racism and segregation in the city of Chicago that has informed how we have thought about housing how we have thought about roadways. And this is uh, Mayor Daley with uh, Bertrand Goldberg, who actually has some ties to uh, Boston and Cambridge, uh, discussing public housing. I bring this example up because there was always this pattern of designing for the other. As there was an influx of particularly minorities, particularly African Americans coming into the city, where do you put them? Here's a snapshot of a two mile stretch of development of Robert Taylor homes that was flanked by the roads, the Dan Ryan system that erased one of the neighborhoods that was there. So now you have a buffer. And sure, when you start to design it, you end up with this prescriptive pathology, which creates a structure of an exclusion that if you don't really care for it, you're going to neglect it. And then there is a metabolic rift, a hole that gets created in the housing and the landscape, and you create a perpetual built environment of otherness and alienation. So that's an example of the, the public housing of Green to Green on the outside of the city. After a period of time of neglect, it becomes blighted. Blight, ironically, is a term from farming and crops. It's the death and decay of a crop so that it no longer sustains life. It has been applied to people and communities and concepts of buildings of urban blight. So an example of blight playing out, it, had it becomes to define an aesthetic of oppression. 
It is a violent response to the erasure of a neighborhood that then gets identified with people. That is a terrible, terrible approach towards design because it has a lasting impact on our perceptions of society. It is a violent process. It's a vicious process. And then we run out of money doing it. Go figure. <laughs> right? And then you're left with this boarded up, again, another form of aesthetic of oppression. Comes in all different for forms. The worst is in the form of a school. We lost 54 schools closed all at the same time in the south side of Chicago, around the city of Chicago, seven in the area that I work in. Um, and it just sits there. Would you shop there for your produce? Would you get your beauty supplies there? No. All right. So there is a question, a legacy of a questions of neighborhoods and education and jobs and sustainability. How can you talk about sustainability? How can you talk about future if there is no hope? And there has been a decades of legacies of no hope or no care or no interest. So instead, we're starting to shift the lens of how we think about ecology related to architecture and urban planning. Ecology is supposed to be this interrelation of relationships in a community, an ecosystem. So I started dabbling with urban agriculture and aquaponics, recirculating water ecosystems, health of the soil, solution-oriented work in communities. Uh, so urban ag versus agriculture, urban versus agriculture is very tricky because urban you don't really farm in the city. Historically, policies don't let you farm in the city. It's illegal. And there is a, a legacy of it in the city of Chicago. Those are that's, uh, cattle <laughs> and, and the waste um, and the industrial warehouses. But reality is these places are getting, they're being erased. They're being torn down. So there is a role for artists to work with architects, planners, aquapons, aquaponic aficionados, um, and farmers to create a paradigm shift for a new normal. We have to create a new normal, which is a structure of inclusion. So a little bit about my organization, Sweetwater Foundation. Our tagline is, there grows the neighborhood, and very intentional. Um, and our mission is looking at regenerative placemaking to help the health and ecology of that once blighted neighborhood. Again, it is a recirculating water ecosystem. You feed the fish, they, eat, they fertilize the water, the water goes to the plants, filters the water, goes to the fish. So we created experiments around it, small scale interventions linked to technology, applied in the classroom, empty, unused classrooms, you clear it out, the students get agency, the teachers get agency, build experiments, and all of a sudden you have a math and science class that you eat from and you share with your neighbor, and it's an art project, right? That goes home, and it has various types of forms of iterations dynamic feedback in the loop. So this is like the future of the kitchen, a vertical system for a culinary school, uh, an outdoor living greenhouse in Milwaukee versus Chicago. And we have these repeat iterations of this experiment and the heuristic. And we scaled it. We took a shoe warehouse in the south side of Chicago, used the existing infrastructure, the metal racking systems, the display cases, and created a commercial operation that was run and led by the youth, by students. That then allows you an opportunity to look at how do you rethink? How do you rethink buildings? How do you explore? How do you share? What is an ecosystem? What is a network across different types of institutions? Last thing, we started looking at this neighborhood development. How do you apply this to an actual neighborhood? How do you have housing stabilization? How do you do, um, link it to career pathways and apprenticeships? and Economy, and so we had a neighborhood plan. And sorry, Sally, this is a couple minutes. A community is an ecosystem. A community can only be as healthy as the nutrient flows in that particular community. If you think of housing as static, you know, then it, it's going to fail. Urban agriculture in itself can't exist on its own without not only the support teams that harvest, that make the business, that make the byproducts that come in the, in the off season, but then also the consumers that eat that food. We actually uh, grew up about six or seven blocks from this location. There's only a handful of houses that, were, that are still left. So how do we rebuild these communities? 
What's the relationship between rebuilding community and rebuilding people? Hello. Hello. My name is Emmanuel Pratt. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Sweetwater Foundation. After years and years of just doing trial and error, learning by doing, like taking the theory and grounding it by transforming an old warehouse uh, you know, into an aquaponics innovation center, a living learning laboratory, taking a, a two acre site that used to be a school that then became demolished and using that as a site to, do, to build the Perry Ave Community Farm that then feeds two to 300 people a week. There's also an employment opportunity for local residents and youth. It's also a research space for urban agriculture education and cultural arts, feeding people, but also looking at new forms of commerce. The most sustainable urban developments are those that have a civic approach that come not from development per se, but from the vitality of the neighborhood itself, which is why I'm very interested in what's happening at Perry Street and what Emmanuel Pratt and his colleagues are doing there around a holistic vision of what a neighborhood, what a community can be. Everyone wants a walkable neighborhood, everyone wants a safe neighborhood, everyone wants these features. It's not exclusive to a certain income level, it's inclusive to everyone who wants these features. That's what humanity wants. The so-called decline uh, for me is um, an opportunity. You can see the emergency, but what, what's the silver lining, what's the opportunity that exists in that? It has to be a system. It can't be in isolation. And We've been working in isolation around these particular knowledge areas for quite some time, and now we have to find a way to merge them together. Imagine what's possible. Here we are in the south side of Chicago, and in one year, what could happen? In five years, we want to see that we're at a point where we look around and we all built this together. We want to say, there grows the neighborhood, because I built this with you. And so the last couple of slides, this is really important. This is a million dollar block. This is a, there's a study of looking at the, the mass incarceration of our population, particularly African Americans. But that farm is a site that every year uh, $2.78 million goes towards keeping the people that used to be in that community in that area incarcerated. And we don't get any of those funds to do rehabilitation. So um, it is becoming a policy issue. How do you begin to look at how do you reshape and redesign these neighborhoods since there's so much vacancy that, is, that can address the rhetoric of the green healthy neighborhood? Um, and the typology and the aesthetic will go from an aesthetic of oppression and an aesthetic of exclusion to an aesthetic of inclusion that will be built by our kids and our youth. And we will apply it to interior design. And uh, we have lots of products that we're making in our new sphere. So um, here's my contact information. Sorry I ran a little bit over, but thank you for your time.